everyone. In this session, I hope to give you a fairly detailed explanation of Helene Sisu's essay, The Laugh of the Medusa. Sisu is not a person who requires an elaborate introduction, at least for the students of English literature. She's a Jewish Algerian French writer. She's a poet, she's a playwright, uh, she's a critic, she's a rhetorician, uh, she's, a, uh, she's a feminist. But her reputation chiefly rests on, on her contributions to feminist literary theory. And uh, it was in the year 1975 that she wrote uh, the, the French essay Le Ré de la Medusa, which was translated into English a year later in 1976 by Keith Cohen and Paula Cohen as The Laugh of the Medusa. And this essay has a place of importance in the world of feminist literary theory as the essay in which Sisu introduced the concept of a creature feminine or feminine writing, a distinctive style of writing for women and by women. And she is the most famous or the greatest representative of literature feminine who uh, taught women that writing could actually liberate them from the shackles of patriarchy. <laughs> Medusa is a monster, a gorgon in Greek mythology, and she's described as a winged uh, female with a living venomous snakes in place of hair. And uh, anybody who looked at her would be turned to stone. And she was a priestess to Athena, the virgin goddess of wisdom and warfare. As a priestess, she was required to be a virgin and devoted to the goddess. But it so happened that Poseidon, the, god, the, the Greek god of uh, sea and um, the rival to Athena, uh, was attracted by her beauty and violated her on the steps of the temple. Even though Medusa was the victim, Athena was very angry and cursed Medusa, giving her her signature snake hair, uh, the stony eyes, and she was transformed into a monster whom no man would ever desire. And uh, Medusa thus became an evil monster and she started taking revenge on all men by turning them into stone, all men who were sent to kill her. And years later, Perseus, the, the son of Zeus, came to the island with winged sandals, uh, a cap um, that could make him invisible, uh, a sword and a shield given by Athena herself. So this mirrored shield enabled him to uh, see Athena's reflection, the, her face without uh, himself being turned to stone. And then he cut off her head and from the droplets of her blood came Pegasus and um, uh, Chrysler. And uh, Perseus used Medusa's head as a weapon on many occasions until later he gifted it to Athena who transformed it, who turned it into an ultimate shield with a metal head of Medusa, terrifying all her enemies with a single look. So this is as far as the mythical story of Medusa goes. <laughs> Now, talking about the significance of this character to uh, Helen Sisu's essay, The Love of the Medusa, uh, in 19, uh, 1940, Sigmund Freud published an essay, Medusa's Head, and this was published posthumously. So, in this short essay, Freud associates Medusa with castration and also decapitation. And this image, the image of Medusa is both terrifying and uh, ambiguous. The, the, the terror of Medusa is thus a terror of castration that is linked to the sight of something. <clears throat> this uh, Medusa, uh, Medusa became a metaphor to portray woman's beauty, oppression and intelligence at the same time. The metaphorical Medusa is associated with the modern psychoanalytical interpretations of Sigmund Freud, who refers to Medusa's head as uh, the supreme talisman who provides the image of castration associated in the child's mind with the discovery of maternal sexuality and its denial. In this essay, Sisu takes on the idea of castration 
with which the phallocentric mind is obsessed and she connects it to Medusa's image so as to prove that man freezes just as he's turned to stone in the, the Greek um, story and a man freezes at the sight of the feminine sex as he's seized by a fear of being turned to a woman. So in the essay, The Love of the Medusa, Ciso reverses the image of, um, the, uh, image of Medusa. In Sisu's account, Medusa is no longer the monster she is traditionally held to be. And uh, she is not the symbol of horror that signifies castration in Freud's analysis either. She is not evil, but she is beautiful and she is laughing. Sisu's rewriting of the myth of Medusa actually illustrates a new writing. Uh, the laughing Medusa represents feminine writing as a powerful intervention that disrupts the reproduction of the phalangocentric order. <laughs>
has become the perfect place or locus for female oppression. Therefore, it was important for men to keep women silenced because once they start raising their voice, then that would lead to subversive thought and even pave the way for social and cultural transformation. <music>
Thus, the change is more likely to happen along the fringes, along the margins far removed from the center uh, or beyond the authority of uh, the phallocentric system. <laughs> People have been reluctant all along to admit that admit the distinction between masculine and feminine writing. In this context, it is important to bear these two points in mind. First, sexual opposition. Sexual opposition has always been to ensure conformity to masculine standards everywhere and even in writing. Sisu calls it the phallocentric mode or the logical logos. She calls uh, sexual opposition the logical logos. So writing against this mode would destroy the binaries of masculine feminine, the logic illogic. When the limits set by the mode is crossed, it will give rise to a body of literary works that will bring femininity into writing. Therefore, it is up to a woman to write and forge for herself this anti-logos weapon to disrupt the cultural privilege of phallocentrism. Most people are not even aware of the distinction between the masculine and feminine writing. It is the feminine difference or distinctiveness that can destabilize the, the sexual opposition that favors men. She has to write in the feminine mode and the experience of a woman attempting to write in the masculine is compared to the experience of a woman attempting seeking the pleasures of male sexuality with an ineffectual paper pen. <laughs> It can be said that Derridean influence is evident in the section where Sisu actually asserts that writing works between the binaries of the masculine and the feminine, the logic and the illogic. The idea of the in-between is a textual and theoretical feature of Derrida's writings. The in-between suggests the identity suggests that the identity of the human subject is fluid and ever-changing. And bringing femininity into writing is not actually an expulsion of masculinity or bringing about an end or death. It is a process of traversing between the binaries and that will, um, and that will destabilize the opposition. And this is the concept of bisexuality. <laughs> concept of bisexuality is suppressed under the concepts of one castration identity and second the fantasy of the total of the total being castration anxiety is a fear of the loss of power or penis according to freud's psychoanalytic theory and uh, the fantasy of the total being is uh, the the fallacy of the total being or the, the the state of perfection with the coming together of two halves in other words a feeling complete and uh, that happens uh, it, it, it was believed it was falsely believed that that the feeling of completeness would come only with the coming together of both halves the masculine and the feminine disregarding their distinctiveness the traditional idea was to treat bisexuality as a neutrality as being neither here nor there and that engendered the fear of castration. Uh, traditional bisexuality was self-effacing and uh, Sisu contrasts this traditional idea with a new kind of bisexuality that identifies oneself as having sexual orientation towards both the sexes. In that aspect, a woman is bisexual whereas a man cannot be so without losing his phallocentric masculine identity. A woman's writing is also bisexual in the sense that she can write to both men and women. This is another type of bisexuality not encoded by a phallocentric representation and hence it's, uh, it is the locus of one's erotic universe. And this is the kind of bisexuality that accepts orientation towards both um, sexes in its various manifestations. 
according to Sisu, femin uh, feminine writing blurs all distinction to make way for an erotic scripture that would subvert the binary opposition. She defines bisexuality as the multiplication of sites of bodily pleasure, the pleasures of choosing a broader mode of sexual expression. As against the bipolarity of sexes, she suggests bimodality, where males and females are identifiable groups who have areas that also overlap and the virtues of each are celebrated. In other words, the traits attributed to each sexes are present in both. <laughs> The concept of Vatic sexuality was introduced by Helen Sisu to oppose the traditional bisexuality that denies sexual difference and imagines the state of a total being. Vatic sexuality does not annul differences. It stirs them up and is in opposition uh, with the self-effacing merger type of bisexuality which uh, falsely believes in the total being with the union of the masculine and the feminine. <laughs> Derrida accuses Lacan of being both phallocentric and logocentric. Sisu and other post-structural feminists critique um, Lacan's uh, theory concept for its uh, subordination of the feminine to the masculine. The phallocentric system of Lacan needs to be deconstructed and new strategies have to be devised for the expression of the relation between language and female bodies. Literature feminine or feminine writing is about the unconscious, the repressed female sexuality. Women should find their own sexuality and once they become, actu and once they become active subjects, the structure of language will change and the language that evolved would be a deconstructed language. Um, Sisu makes mention of the Penelope episode in uh, James Joyce's Ulysses to illustrate the emotional complexity of marriage and fidelity. The sexual associations of Molly Bloom is contrasted with Penelope's fidelity to her long absent husband in order to make and makes her an emblematic of the ideal woman. Like Penelope, Every woman has to spin the textual thread that will lead her to salvation. The writing process is a process of transformation. To, to weave her own stories, she has to return to the patriarchal canon and unearth the narratives of the past that kept her silenced and in the dark. In other words, writing has the capacity to undo the silence and death of trauma and bring it to life and to light. She feels liberated to follow diverse routes with lots of encounters and transformations. Sisu accuses Freud of a form of gender apartheid and of perpetuating a myth about the impenetrable nature of the female conscious. Um, Freud's imaginary mapping of the female sexuality and the clumsy manner in which he tries to repress femininity makes his psychoanalysis not much different from other human sciences that is just reproducing the masculine view. The female unconscious remains untapped and unmapped by psychoanalytical theory. And as women have been made to believe that it was too dark a place, too dark an area to be traversed and explored. In other words, this is as perceived by the male colonial cartographer and explorer. In fact, even Sisu's uh, writing is caught in the desire to totalize the history of a woman and is based on a deeply Eurocentric consensus on African darkness. She represents a Freud's dark continent as a masculine con construct. Female sexuality is an abyss, a mysterious dark room, an unexplored but claimed territory or country. 
the phrase uh, Medusa and um, uh, Abyss indicate the choices for a woman in phallic discourse. The choice is between the silence of castration and the silence of decapitation. In other words, she has no choice at all. She is always logged in silence because either she speaks in a language that is not her own or her words are not received by a man's ears that are conditioned to hear only when they speak in the masculine. Sisu reminds us of the patriarchal nature of the myth and the fact that it articulates a falsehood. She does so with reference to the sirens of mythology. The idea that um, sirens were uh, female enchantresses uh, enticing men in order to drain all their uh, vigor is a masculine construction. And all women can liberate themselves from this. All women must liberate themselves from this absurdity and stop listening to this. History is just a story that can be changed but only if serious efforts are taken to alter it. For uh, Helene Sisu, Ecriture Feminine is not just the prerogative of female writers but is also a mode of writing that has been employed by male authors like James Joyce and Jean Genet. Sisu has named Genet as one of a small number of French authors in whose work femininity is inscribed. The work she mentions is Funeral Rites which was written in the year 1948. A lot needs to be written about uh, the, the infinite complexity of sexuality, uh, eroticism, arouses and the innumerable other feelings related to the awakening and discovery of one's body. And when this happens, it would transform the traditional masculine mother tongue to one that will echo and reverberate with more than one language and then let a creature feminine will evolve. We've always been taught to be ashamed of our own bodies. She also says that the ideas of heterosexuality has also been ingrained in our minds. Sisu urges women to steal their voices back from the men, to ignite their mouths, to impregnate their words and rise high without the phallogos structures of men. To do this, she must denounce the masculine language, which is the father tongue. By abandoning the linear and orderly characteristics associated with traditional masculine style, Sisu uses the phallogocentric language to her advantage. When the repressed comes back to reclaim themselves, it will happen with such force and destructiveness as to restore the female principle in our society and culture. The end of the, uh, the, end of the phallic period could either be a total annihilation of women or it could be taken up high to a violent brilliance. And when the woman throws down the seven ways of modesty and emerges forth in all her shockingly honest self, laying bare her passion, her carnal desires, it is the mosaic statue of phallocentric authority that is shattered. Sisu analyzes the role female body and sexuality play in the context of women's writing. The female body is considered a key for women to resist masculine thinking. If she's always been working within the masculine discourse, it is time that she broke herself free and invented a language that will enable her to gush forth with ease and then she would be able to fly away and transgress the boundaries both verbal and physical. A true feminine text is actually more than subversive. It not only overthrows an established order, it is like a volcano and it, it can bring about an upheaval of the traditional order and shatter false truth with laughter triumphantly. This new female goes adventuring beyond this new female goes adventuring without the masculine temerity into anonymity. She is fearless and there is no castration anxiety. 
Sesu also talks about Nietzsche and she berates him for thinking that women are selfish and gives only to take, which is actually an attribute of men. Sisu talks about the immense capacity for women to depropriate. Depropriate is a form of renunciation, a willingness to relate to the world without imposing the conditions of possession. <laughs>
lead, leading them on to an untiring and never-ending search for love. And she concludes with the words, in one another we will never be lacking, which means that in an exchange that is no longer controlled by phallocentric values, women will never lack anything. Thank you.